Howdy everybody, Dr. Andy Woods here. Today is March the 22nd, 2024. This is Pastor's Point of View, number 294. We have a prophecy update for folks today. Um, I'm back with my friend, colleague, fellow elder, associate pastor, Dr. Jim McGowan. If you take a look at the screen, you see the outline of what we're gonna try to march through um, today. More information on Israel alone. Uh, some of the Gog-Magog situation continues to fall into alignment. The big bullet point for today, though, is going to be number three. Um, we're going to watch, <laughs> very tragically, to watch our Constitution just in a total state of deterioration. Uh, we'll explain the prophetic significance of that. <clears throat> We've got some more information concerning persecution against God's people, both home and abroad. <clears throat> and since this is Holy Week next week, I should say, where we're getting ready to celebrate the death, burial, resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to say a couple words on the, the true gospel. Amen. Um, I notice, Brother Jim, as I go different places, evangelicals use the gospel, the word gospel constantly, but I think very few actually understand what it is. Yeah. And so we're going to try to recover that loss of understanding, at least some of it today. But let's go ahead and start with Israel alone. And um, we have a couple of prophecies from the book of Zechariah that we typically quote when we get into this subject. And so remind us of what those prophecies say. All right, we're gonna be reading from the New American Standard 95 update. We're gonna begin with Zechariah chapter 12, verse three. It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples and all who lift it will be severely injured and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. And then in chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, for I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished and half of the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. Now, just to time stamp these prophecies a little bit from Zechariah, these were given 500 years before Jesus ever lived. So yes. we're going back 2,500 years ago. And there the prophet Zechariah twice predicts Israel would be born again politically in unbelief. We know she's un in unbelief when these prophecies start finding their realization because the Holy Spirit, Zechariah 12, verse 10, has not yet been poured out on the nation of Israel. Yes. And in that state of unbelief, um, it's very clear. It says it over and over again, all the nations uh, yeah. will come against Israel and Jerusalem. So the big question with prophecies like this has always been, well, if that's so, if that's going to be, how could the United States, um, a faithful friend of Israel historically, a faithful ally of Israel, how could she fit into the all <laughs> yeah. and also come against the Jewish people and the Jewish state in the last days? And, and I'm here to tell you that ever since the advent of the Obama administration, and then we had an interruption of it with the Trump administration, but then came the Biden administration, which we've been under for the last uh, four years or so. Um, the nation of the great United States of America is turning against, coming against the nation of Israel, yeah. fitting into the prophetic uh, orbit that Zechariah predicted would happen to all nations yes. in the last days. Yes. So as evidence of it, we have this uh, article from APnews.com, March the 14th, 2024. It says, top Democrat Schumer, now he's the Senate majority leader, calls for new elections in Israel, saying Netanyahu of Israel is an obstacle to peace. Being a Jewish individual himself, you would think, this would be someone who would know better, but notice his what is is called out by the uh, opposing party later on in the article. Notice his what I would consider to be over the top rhetoric. Yes, sir. 
Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer on Thursday called on Israel to hold new elections, saying he believes Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has lost his way and is an obstacle to peace in the region amid a growing humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Schumer, the first Jewish majority leader in the Senate and the highest ranking Jewish official in the U.S., strongly criticized Netanyahu in a 40-minute speech Thursday morning on the Senate floor. Schumer said the prime minister has put himself in a coalition of far-right extremists and, quote, as a result, he has been too willing to tolerate the civilian toll in Gaza, which is pushing support for Israel worldwide to historic lows. He goes on to say Israel cannot survive if it becomes a pariah. The high-level warning comes as an increasing number of Democrats have pushed back against Israel and as President Joe Biden has stepped up public pressure on Netanyahu's government, arguing that he needs to pay more attention to the civilian death toll in Gaza amid the Israeli bombardment. And just interrupting you there just for a second, I mean, really what they're upset about is October the 7th. Yeah. You know, the events of October the 7th of last year have really done something good in in a certain sense, Uh, negative circumstances, but something good actually has come out of it. It's really exposed the anti-Semites. That's true. uh, The the anti-Israel people, they have just come out of the woodwork. And they're trying to make this argument that somehow Israel's reaction against Hamas in Gaza, you know, to prevent future October 7th from happening you know, is somehow um, out of bounds, over the top. And this is exactly what Chuck Schumer, yeah. you know, the majority leader in the United States Senate is saying. Um, sorry for interrupting you. No, no, no problem. Uh, continuing, uh, Schumer's speech also drew a swift reprisal from Republicans. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell said on the Senate floor immediately after Schumer's speech that, quote, Israel deserves an ally that acts like one Mm. and that foreign observers ought to refrain from weighing in. The Democratic Party has an anti-Israel problem, McConnell said, quote, either we respect their decisions or we disrespect their democracy. And at a House GOP retreat in West Virginia, House Speaker Mike Johnson from uh, Louisiana called Schumer's speech inappropriate. It's just plain wrong for an American leader to play such a divisive role in Israeli politics while our closest ally in the region is in an existential battle for its very survival. And that was, again, Mike Johnson, the House Speaker. Yeah, in other words, Schumer's rhetoric was so over the top that it earned a reprisal from Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House, Mitch McConnell, um, Senate Minority Leader. And, you know, these kind of statements that Schumer is making, you know, they're not coming from crazy professors or kooky websites. I mean, he's like the majority leader of the United States Senate. Yeah. You know, acting like Israel is a pariah state simply for rooting out terrorism within its own borders defending themselves yeah. Yeah. and so i look at things like this and i, I have to think frequently of zechariah's prophecies yeah. of the nations turning against israel in the last days by the way as we do this it won't bode well for our nation oh boy. Uh, can That's you remind us what genesis chapter 12 and verse 3 says yes sir genesis 12 3 and i will bless those who bless you And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God evaluates nations based on their treatment of the Jewish people and the Jewish nation. And any nation that mistreats Israel, you know, will typically find itself on the ash heap of of history. And, um, you know, it's troubling to watch, but this is what God said would happen, you know, in the last days. That's right. Would you add anything to that? No, I just uh, pray for America. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's not so much uh, Israel needs America, but I think America needs Israel. You got that right. Well Um, said. Let's go to our second category here, the Gog Magog Coalition. I'm going to make some comments here about Rosh or Russia. 
if you are have some exegetical issues that Rosh really is Russia in Ezekiel's great prophecy, Ezekiel 38 and 39, I'd recommend my book, The Middle East uh, Meltdown. We explain exegetically who the different players are in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Very informative. But you'll notice this particular map here. We've got Rosh or Russia circled. Uh, Ezekiel is very clear that Russia will, with a conglomeration of others, come against the nation of Israel in the last days. Yes. Now, if that prophecy means what it says and says what it means, then you have to see in preparation for this, a belligerent, bellicose Russia, yeah. which has not always existed. Uh, prior to the communist revolution in 1917, Russia was a Christian Orthodox country. Yeah. But Ezekiel indicates that Russia's character would change. She would become more hostile to Israel and the West. And that's exactly what we've seen rolled out, you know, ever since the communist revolution right. and, the, and the rebirth of Israel. Almost any yeah. skirmish that the Jewish people find themselves in with the Arabs, some way, somehow you find that Russia is, you know, subsidizing or uh, assisting, you know, these yeah. various skirmishes. That's true. And just keep all of that history in mind when we read these latest comments by Putin. Yeah. The leader of Russia saying things like, you know, we're ready for nuclear war. Wow. <laughs> and so here's um, an article from Reuters, March the 14th, 2024. It says, Putin warns the West, that would include Israel and us, Russia is ready for nuclear war. What's going on here? President Vladimir Putin told the West on Wednesday that Russia was technically ready for nuclear war, quoting, from a military technical point of view, we are, of course, ready, Putin 71 told Rossiya One Television and news agency RIA when asked whether Russia was ready or really ready for a nuclear war. He goes on, and again quoting him, he says, weapons, and listen to this carefully, weapons exist in order to use them, Putin said. Yeah. There it is. So, there it is. Um, you know, Putin says we're ready for nuclear war. Weapons exist in order to use them. Wow. You know, I, I know there's a lot of controversy concerning what to do related to Ukraine, uh, but keep in mind who invaded who. I mean, it was Russia that invaded the Ukraine, or Ukraine, not the other way around. That's right. And when you just look at a map, you'll see in between uh, Russia and Israel is Ukraine. <laughs> that's that's so, right. So yeah. that's why I find this very interesting. Their movement down fr uh, from the north, perhaps <laughs> making eventually a trajectory into the nation of Israel, yeah. which is what God said would happen in the last days. Exactly. I mean, a very interesting prophecy Ezekiel made when you consider that Russia didn't have the character of an expansionistic empire until, you know, post 1917. Yeah. And um, yeah. uh, there we have it. Mm. So with that being said, let's go ahead and move into our third bullet point. We've got about four articles here to share, and it really has to do with the demise and the destruction of the United States Constitution by people that really should know better. Uh, influencers, key interpreters, key scholars of the Constitution uh, almost seem to not even understand what it's about. And I think this is prophetically significant because one of the greatest straitjackets that has been given on the globalists is the United States Constitution. That's right. And I've for a long time believed that the type of new world order that the Bible predicts for the last days cannot come into existence until there's been some sort of demolition of the United States Constitution. Yes. But let's just remind ourselves of the type of government that will exist on planet Earth before Jesus returns. What does Revelation 13 verses 16 through 18 say? Yes, sir. Revelation 13, 16 through 18. And he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. 
And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Now, as we explore this kind of economy for the last days, does this seem like a group of people here on planet Earth that enjoy private property rights? <laughs> Doesn't sound like it. I mean, it sounds to me like privacy, uh, private property rights, um, the idea that the government cannot invade your personal space. What you own is yours. A man's home is his castle. You know, mm. these kinds of yeah. these kinds of um, statements. I mean, it seems to me that those are largely a thing of the past. Yeah. And private property as we now know it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. We have a similar prediction made in Daniel 7 and verse 23. Daniel 7, 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. The expression whole earth is interesting. That's globalism yeah. or one worldism. And then these expressions, tread down, you know, crush, that's speaking of a tyrannical yeah. runaway government. It doesn't seem to me that there's people under this that enjoy Second Amendment rights, I don't uh, private so. property rights, First Amendment rights. And so as you're watching uh, the Constitution being whittled down to almost nothing, I think it's largely preparatory for this maximum new world order mm -hmm. that Scripture tells us is on the horizon. Yes, so sir. with all of that being said, notice what's going on with our Second Amendment. Uh, this is an article from Breitbart. This is something that a district court judge just did. You know, Even though the Second Amendment is under great attack for ordinary American citizens, this judge <laughs> yeah. at the district court level just ruled that a gun ban for illegal immigrants is unconstitutional. So if you're here in the country legally, expect your Second Amendment rights to deteriorate. Exactly. But if you're here illegally, uh, no problem. Anything goes. <laughs> the Second Amendment applies to you. So what, what, what happened here? This is an article wow. March the 16th. On March 8, 2024, U.S. District Judge Sharon Johnson Coleman decided against a federal ban on gun ownership for illegal immigrant Heriberto Carvajal Flores. The case at hand centered on, his, on him because he was charged with possession of a firearm while illegally or unlawfully in the United States. He had a handgun in his possession in the Little Village neighborhood of Chicago, Illinois on June 1, 2020. He was charged for being a non-citizen in possession of a firearm. Coleman, a Barack Obama appointee, countered government arguments against Carvajal Flores' firearm possession. Uh, and here's what happened. Coleman ultimately concluded... This is her statement quoting the non-citizen possession statute 18 U.S.C. section 922 G5 violates the Second Amendment as applied to Carvajal Flores. Now, keep in mind, this is a district court ruling, which is the lowest federal court. So hopefully someone will have some sanity at some point and, yes, and re Jesus. reverse this. <laughs> But notice that this particular judge, Sharon Johnson Coleman, is an Obama appointee. You know, what a shock, right? Yeah. And notice that what they're doing here with this particular statute, um, she concluded the non-citizen possession of statute 18 U.S.C. 922 G5 violates the Second Amendment. So, so let me just kind of get this straight here. <laughs> We're going to have Second Amendment rights for illegals. Yeah. But the pattern for legals that enjoy Second Amendment rights is always a chipping away. So if that pattern continues, what are you going to have in the United States? I mean, basically, you're going to have a disarmed society. Yep. Uh, and even if they don't disarm weapons for our use, they're going to pass so many regulations that it's almost uh, it's just a hassle to get one mm -hmm. and keep one. But at the same time, they're arming the illegal population of the United States of America. I mean... <laughs> 
If wow. that trend continues, are they not creating a situation where our citizens are unarmed and then you have sort of a illegal army? Um, a militia. A huh? militia within yeah. the, United, the borders of the United States of America. I just read, I don't have a screenshot for this, in the New York Post that members of Hezbollah just got caught coming over the border. <laughs> Surprise. So we're going to arm those types of people. Yeah. And we're going to disarm the American uh, population. I mean, that can't end well for normal people like us. That's frightening. But but is it not preparatory for what God indicates will happen at the end of the age concerning the new world order? Absolutely. And what would you add to that? Well, you're you're reversing things here. You're taking the power away from the citizens and giving it to the non-citizens, which is going to set up anarchy wherein the, the government then can come in and claim that they have the right to fix that situation. So next thing you know, all of our rights are gone. Yeah. Now, you would think that certainly highly trained lawyers would be up to speed on this <laughs> and would move into positions of influence and reverse that because, after all, there's a lot of academic rigor that you have to go through to become an attorney. I mean, I know a little something about it. I'm a, a licensed attorney in the state of California, it's not easy to just become an attorney. You've got to go to law school. You've got to pass the bar exam. I, I passed the California bar exam. But surprise, look at this, Brother Jim. State of Washington uh, article that just came out March the 15th, 2024. The Supreme Court of Washington just ruled that the bar exam will no longer be required to become an attorney in Washington state. <laughs> so wow. they they just wow. took the barriers to entry, the <laughs> professionalism and excellence and academic mastery that you have to have to become an attorney, yeah. and they just took they just uh, took the barrier and they they removed it. Yeah. So so what? And they're doing it by the way on the basis of CRT. Yes. Thank critical you. race theory. Thank so, you for adding so that. So what's going on here? Yeah. This is the woke article for the day. Yes. The bar exam will no longer be required to become a lawyer in Washington, the state Supreme Court ruled in a pair of orders Friday. The court approved alternative ways to show competency and earn a law license after appointing a task force to examine the issue in 2020. The bar licensure tax task force found that the traditional exam, quote, disproportionately and unnecessarily blocks marginalized groups from becoming practicing attorneys and is at best minimally effective for ensuring competency, according to a news release from the Washington Administrative Office of the Courts. Washington is the second state to not require the bar exam exam following Oregon, which implemented the change at the start of this year. Other states, including Minnesota, Nevada, South Dakota, and Utah, are examining alternative pathways to licensure. And then there's so 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 this is a trending yeah trend a a trend a pattern. Yes, Um, it is. Oregon did the same thing. Yeah. Other states contemplating this are Minnesota, Nevada, South Dakota, Utah, of all places, are even going down this this road. Help us with the rest of that. All right. The article terminates uh, basically with this. Gonzaga School of Law Dean Jacob Rooksby hopes for guardrails so that the goal of increasing diversity and meeting legal needs in marginalized communities is met. So the excuse for it is the bar exam is too difficult and it's going to you know, uh, ostracize people that, that don't have... Um, the educational ability. Um, I'm sorry, everyone has the educational ability. Uh, uh, I think one of the best uh, Supreme Court justices we have on the court today is Clarence Thomas. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, who happens to be black. Mm-hmm. I mean, are we going to say that black people don't have the educational ability to pass the bar exam? Is essentially what they're saying here. And they're using this critical race theory idea yeah. to dismantle Anything in our culture that's related to professionalism and excellence, uh, it's all under the banner of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, I think it's semi-racist what they're saying because they're saying certain people of certain racial groups 
by the way, I hate that word race because the Bible says there's one race, one. the human race. Yeah. But in their way of thinking, you know, certain race, racial groups aren't going to be able to pass. So when you make a statement like that, you're saying people of certain racial groups are not as smart as other racial groups, which is completely wrong. Oops. Ben Carson is one of the most brilliant yes. medical doctors on yes. the face of the earth. Yeah. Clarence Thomas, as I mentioned before, is yeah. one of the most brilliant jurists on the face of the earth. The only thing that's happening here is is not uh, anything other than the destruction of excellence. And what you can start to see from the legal profession is a lower standard Few and f fewer people understanding what the Constitution actually says and actually means. Very few people standing up for what our, you know, founding fathers intended. Yeah. So this is a this is a trend that's happening in the legal world that obviously, in my opinion, is not moving in the right direction. What would you add? Well, all I can say is don't do anything to get in trouble with the law because you're likely to be standing before a judge with an incompetent lawyer. Yeah. Let's just call it like it is. Yeah, and, and and then beyond that, the judge himself or herself would be would be incompetent. As we'll see shortly. I mean, as we'll see shortly, that's <laughs> correct. You know, when you get on a, an airplane to to fly, I mean, you want to know that your pilot has fulfilled basic educational competency, right? I mean, you're putting your life into his yeah. or her hands. Yeah. Well, how is it any different than what you do with an, a lawyer or appearing before a judge and this standard of excellence is now swept away. Um, mm. So cheer up, folks. It actually gets worse, a lot worse. Here yeah. is an article from foxnews.com. March the 18th, 2024. And it deals with Justice Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson raises eyebrows, I wouldn't say eyebrows were raised i would call this a mic drop moment yeah. okay this is yeah. something that she just said in the course of oral arguments yeah. she made the comment that the first amendment hamstrings government and it deals with a, a case called mirth versus biden which the supreme court is expected to rule on uh this summer and it's a case really dealing with the Biden administration in the midst of all of the COVID stuff. Mm -hmm. 2020 and beyond, putting pressure on social media platforms to silence voices and make sure those social media platforms are only reporting the government narrative. Yeah. Well, what has happened over the course of time is a lawsuit has been brought against the Biden administration for interfering with social media and an obvious, to my mind, an obvious overreach, you know, getting involved in restricting uh, the free expression of ideas. Yes. Uh -huh. And what Katanji uh, Brown Jackson said in oral argument is, well, you know what? The First Amendment, really what it's, it's there to do is to protect the government speech. She should have just stopped right there. Yeah. Protect government <laughs> speech. In other words... The problem isn't government telling social media platforms what to do. The problem is you lawyers that are trying to bring this lawsuit, you're trying to hamstring the government. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a mic drop moment <laughs> because when you study our constitutional system, you look at our Bill of Rights, all of them <laughs> yes. are handcuffs on the state. Exactly. They're not there to, you know, make the state's job easier by removing any obstacles from the state. Yeah. They're supposed to have the exact opposite effect. So you take, for example, the First Amendment. It says Congress, notice who the restriction is on, Congress, shall make no law, you know, re uh, interfering with religion or, or establishing it. So the First Amendment is a restriction on the government. The Second Amendment, we talked about it earlier, the right to keep and bear arms is a restriction on the government. The Fourth Amendment, you know, our individual protection from unreasonable searches and seizures is a, is a restraint on the government. Uh, the Fifth Amendment, which protects us from self-incrimination, being coerced to testify against ourselves, and also how the government can't take property without due process, uh, without yeah. just compensation. That is a restriction on the government. Yes, the Sixth is. Amendment, the 
Seventh Amendment, right to fair and speedy and free trials, right to, um, you know, a jury of your peers. All of these things are a restriction on the government. The, the Eighth Amendment, the our protection from cruel and unusual punishment is a restriction from the government. Yep. So on the government. So that's a no brainer. That's like constitutional law 101. <laughs> yes, sir. And here you have a Supreme Court <laughs> justice that apparently doesn't understand that. <laughs> And thinks that the First Amendment is there to trample down the citizens to make the government's job easier. So that's what I would call a mic drop moment. And this is someone that has um, now gone to, in terms of her career, the highest court in the land. And you wonder what in the world are they teaching in these law schools, if anything. And this is what happens when you take the standards for becoming a, an attorney mm. And you you lower them to almost nothing. Yeah. This is the type of insanity that you get. So I've, I've talked enough. Mm. Help us with that article. In a debate Monday at the Supreme Court challenging the Biden administration's alleged coordination with big tech to censor certain messages, one justice raised eyebrows in her comments about the government's relationship with the First Amendment. The case stems from a lawsuit brought by Republican-led states Missouri and Louisiana that accused high-ranking government officials of working with giant social media companies, quote, under the guise of, compa of combating misinformation that ultimately led to censoring speech on topics that included Hunter Biden's laptop, COVID-19 origins, and the efficacy of face masks, which the states argued was a First Amendment violation. In nearly two hours of oral arguments, the justices debated whether the Biden administration crossed the constitutional line and whether its, out, its outreach efforts with private companies amounted to permissible persuasion or encouragement versus illegal coercion or threats of retaliation. And, and before we get to uh, Justice uh, Ketanji Brown-Jackson, I mean, just to be clear, this is what the Biden administration was doing during the whole pandemic. Yes, or it was. Plandemic or mandemic. I mean, it was basically putting pressure on social media platforms to not carry uh, any type of information, censor any type of information out there that went against their interpretation. Well, that's a clear First Amendment violation. Uh, in fact, when that was happening, you might recall, Brother Jim, that we did a show on this. <laughs> yes. And that particular section we entitled The Day the First Amendment Died, because that's essentially what happened. So they're bringing this lawsuit to, you know, hold these people accountable. And here, here's the comment from Ketanji Brown Jackson. What does she say? All right, Justice Jackson took a different approach. <laughs> different. Here's what she did. <laughs> Quoting, your view has the First Amendment hamstringing, hamstringing the federal government in significant ways. Stop, stop right there. Yes, yes. yes. Well done, <laughs> Justice that's, that's Jackson. What, that's what the First Amendment is supposed to do. It is supposed to hamstring the government. Sorry for I should have put a period right there. <laughs> but no, but folks, it goes on. It says uh, you've, uh, you've hamstring, hamstringing the federal government in, sig in significant ways in the most important time periods, she told the lawyer representing Louisiana, Missouri, and private plaintiffs, quoting, the government actually has a duty to take steps to protect the citizens of this country by encouraging or even, or even pressuring platforms to take down harmful information, close quote, she said. So the First Amendment <laughs> guarantees the government's ability to control and censor private platforms. Is, did you see how lopsided this is? <laughs> yes. Wow. But we're not done. <laughs> Missouri Attorney General, uh, General uh, Andrew Bailey told Fox News Digital in an interview that Justice Jackson was, quote, absolutely right. It's, it is hamstringing, and it's supposed to be. Can you read that last sentence again? Yes, it is hamstringing, and it's supposed to. When she's complaining about the First Amendment hamstringing the government, he's like, duh, that's, yes. that's, what, it's, Hello. that's what it's been doing for 200 plus years. Goes on, the whole purpose of the Constitution is to protect us from the government. 
and the government exists to protect our rights. But here, the federal government is ignoring our First Amendment protections and weaponizing the federal government to silence our voices, Bailey said. And she's right. It limits what the federal government can and can't do, and that's a good thing, he added. So what you're seeing, folks, is a total perversion by people at the highest levels of our Constitution. You know, the Second Amendment, that applies to illegals. I wish they were aggressive about the Second Amendment applying to citizens. <laughs> and yeah. then number two, oh, by the way, um, the First Amendment is there to expedite the what the government wants to do. Empower not, the government. Yeah, empower the government, yeah. not not yeah. to stop it. And And let's go to this next article God. here. This is our, <laughs> I believe, our last one on this particular section this is you know what what would you do brother jim if you owned a house and someone let's say you own two houses <laughs> so you're i don't but <laughs> yeah neither do i but let's just pretend okay okay you, you own a house then you own another house and everything's fine and then somebody breaks into your house that you're not living in and satisfies a 30-day requirement, okay? And then you show up at house number two where they broke in and are now living, uh, plus 30 days. And you tell them to get out, and you change the locks, and then the government comes along and arrests you for violating the law. What, what would you think about that type of scenario? I would think I was in a nightmare. <laughs> well, that's exactly what's happened. Uh, notice this article from The Sun, March the 20th, 2024. It says, lock and key. These people are going to get away with stealing my home. The owner cries after her arrest at her $1 million house for changing the locks. Whew. Um, plus a, uh, a video about a homeowner who found a convicted sex, sex trafficker squatting in his home. So you have criminals entering your house and living there and living there beyond a prescribed statutory period of 30 days. And if you try to get them out, then you're the one that's the bad guy. You're the one that's the criminal. I mean, what what is happening is basic constitutional concepts like ownership of private property, the right to keep and bear arms for legals, the fact that the First Amendment is a restraint on the government and not the citizenry. It's all being twisted and perverted into something that was never intended, which is preparatory for maximum government in the new world order. Yeah. But help us with this article. This is insanity. It is. Here, here we go. A homeowner has been arrested after changing the locks on her property after squatters broke in and made themselves at home. Adele Andaloro from Queens, New York, inherited her family's home in Flushing after her parents passed away. While she was in the process of selling the $1 million property, Andaloro noticed that the entire front door and locks had been changed. Squatters had moved into the vacant home last month and refused to leave. Things then went from bad to worse as the 47-year-old found herself in handcuffs rather than the people living in her home. Andaloro is well aware that in New York, squatters get rights to a property after living there for 30 days. Cops interviewed the homeowner, the neighbors, and the men asking for documentation proving that they had been there for more than 30 days. Now, and they didn't have it. But to go on, despite it being Andaloro's property, cops warned her that changing the locks could violate the rights of anyone who turns up saying they have been evicted. Andaloro was then arrested for unlawful eviction because she changed the locks. So, 30 days. I mean, all, all I really have to do as a criminal is, is find a house, and I've just got to live there 30 days without the owner knowing that I'm there. And if I can get beyond that 30-day period, where is this, in the state of New, New York, York, then I'm there forever. 
and any type of eviction against me will get the owner thrown in jail <laughs> instead of me. <laughs> Boy, yeah. what, a, what a great way to acquire property. A well, $1 million <laughs> home. <laughs> My goodness. Wow. And I, I just want people to understand how perverted this is. This is. Um, can you remind us what John Adams said? He was the second president of the United States of America and obviously knows something about uh, the intention of our founding fathers. What does John Adams say? If we can put that quote up. Yes, he is a man of sanity. Listen to this quote. The moment the idea is admitted into society that property is not as sacred as the laws of God and that there is not a force of law and public justice to protect it, anarchy and tyranny commence. If thou shalt not covet and thou shalt not steal were not commandments of heaven, they must be made invi invi inviolable precepts in every society before it can be civilized or made free. So what he's saying there Found. is, look, if you can't respect private property, by the way, the concept of private property comes from above. Yes. Because two of the commandments are thou shalt not covet and thou shalt not steal. I mean, aren't these people coveting and stealing what doesn't belong to them? <laughs> Successfully the right to private property comes from above. And if a nation will not accept those concepts, then he says anarchy mm -hmm. and tyranny yeah. will soon commence. Yeah. That's what our world is being prepared for right now, based <laughs> exactly. on some of the passages we exactly. read earlier, is it's being prepared for one world tyranny. Yeah. And you can't have one world tyranny until the existing constitutional structure is, is destroyed. And, and that's what we're watching happen. Wow. Um, one other quick category here before we get to the true gospel, and it has to do with persecution. We know that there's going to be persecution against God's people in the last days. Look no further than Revelation 17 and verse 6 uh, to see that. All right, Revelation 17, 6. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. So you have a, a woman arising from the city of Babylon, a system coming from a city who in the events of the tribulation period will, will literally be drunk with the blood of the saints. Blood of the saints is speaking of massive martyrdoms yeah. during that time period. And as we've tried to explain many times, the world just can't, this, can't show up at this point without massive preparation for it. Yeah. And almost everywhere you look today, uh, Christians are being discriminated against, excluded, and persecuted, even yeah. right here in the late great United States of America. Notice this article from the Christian Post. Uh, a Christian actress was ordered to pay $350,000. I mean, that's over a hundred thousand dollars over a quarter of a million if i'm reading that right after being fired for what a bible verse that she put on social media mm. i mean that that gets you fired yeah and fined three hundred and fifty thousand mm. dollars what's going on here say omuba a christian actress dismissed from a stage adapta adaptation of the color purple for her alleged homophobic remarks, has lost a protracted legal battle culminating in a directive to cover legal expenses exceeding $350,000. The controversy began with a social media post that led to her removal from the production, sparking a five-year legal dispute over allegations of religious discrimination. Omuba, who had not read the play's script before accepting the role, contended she was unaware of the character's sexual orientation. Her stance on not playing certain characters due to her religious convictions, including rejecting a role in the Book of Mormon, was highlighted during the tribunal. Her legal appeal, including the objection to the substantial legal fees, was unsuccessful. Aaron Lee Lambert, associated, associated with the musical Hamilton, had highlighted Omuba's past Facebook post, which questioned the legitimacy of being born gay and labeled homosexuality as incorrect. 
In the 2014 post, Omuba urged Christians to, quote, tell the truth about homosexuality, writing, quote, it is clearly evident in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, what the Bible says on this matter. I do not believe you can be born gay, and I do not believe homosexual, homosexuality is right. I do believe that everyone sins and falls into temptation, but it's by the asking of forgiveness, repentance, and the grace of God that we overcome and live how God ordained us to, which is that a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Genesis 2.24 God loves everyone. Just because he doesn't agree with your decisions doesn't mean he doesn't love you. Christians, we need to step up and love, but also tell the truth of God's word, she added. She goes on and she says, I'm tired of lukewarm Christianity. Be inspired to stand up for what you believe and the truth. In his tweet, Lambert asked, quote, Do you still stand by this post? Or are you happy to remain a hypocrite, seeing as you've now been announced to be playing an LGBTQ character? I think we, I think you owe LB, LGBTQ peers an exclamation, an explanation, excuse me, immediately. Omuba's post prompted the, the theater to demand a retraction from her, which she declined, leading to her contract's cancellation. Supported by the Christian Legal Center, Omuba initiated legal action in August 2019. She said at the time, quote, I just quoted what the Bible says about homosexuality, the need for repentance, but ultimately God's love for all humanity. So it is um, an interesting case and it's an interesting situation that we now find ourselves where merely stating what the Bible says. I mean, I think she did a good job in her post yeah. accurately reflecting biblical truth mm -hmm. And it's an older post. I mean, it goes back to 2014. It's interesting to me that people would dig that up and then use it as a basis for her termination and her firing. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that, that happens all of the time to yeah. Christians. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I, it's kind of interesting that, I mean, how, how would they react if she quoted from the Quran, mm -hmm. talking about what the Quran says about homosexuality? I doubt the reaction would come against her, you know, the way that it's now coming against her. Yeah. But it's, it's, uh, we're now living it at this time in history where, you know, being a Christian, publicly expressing your views about Christianity is enough for harassment, termination. And I largely think that this is preparatory for the type of massive persecution that the world and God's people will see during the tribulation period. Amen, what, what would you add to that? I totally agree with you. Totally agree. So with all that being said, we do have some good news. Let's move here to number five, the true gospel. Uh, now we're going to quote something here related to the thief on the cross. Now this is something that we have used before, I think this time of the year, uh, during Holy Week, as we next week get ready to commemorate the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. And it's, a, it's sort of a commentary concerning the thief on the cross. Yes. Jesus, I believe it's in Luke 23, was crucified between two thieves. One was mocking Jesus till the very end, and the other simply reached out in faith and said, Lord, when you enter your kingdom, remember me. Yeah. Now that, and Jesus, yeah. of course, responded by giving the penitent thief immediate assurance of his salvation. Yes, he did. And this is a troubling passage for modern day Christianity because modern day Christianity thinks you got to work your way into God's presence. Yeah. And if you are a Christian, there's got to be a lot of fruit and works in your life to prove you're a Christian. The yeah. thief on the cross had none of those things. That's right. And uh, Thank you, Jesus. this little co commentary, and I'm not even sure who wrote this. This is kind of floating around on social media. But every time I read this, it, it resonates with yes. me yes. because it reflects the biblical truth about grace. Yes. I mean, the only thing that saves a person is Jesus. And the condition that he requires is faith alone yes. in Christ alone. Yes. And it's not a matter of good works on the front end or the back end. 
that indicate whether you get to heaven. Yeah. The whole thief on the cross narrative or story demonstrates this, yeah. and this is nicely brought out in this uh, anonymous commentary. So remind us what this commentary says. No baptism, no communion, no confirmation, no speaking in tongues, no mission trip, no volunteering, no financial gifts, and no church clothes. He couldn't even bend his knees to pray. He didn't say the sinner's prayer. And among other things, he was a thief. Jesus didn't take away his pain, heal his body, or smite his scoffers. Yet, it was a thief who walked into paradise the same hour as Jesus simply by believing. He had nothing more to offer other than his belief that Jesus was who he said he was. No spin from brilliant theologians, no ego or arrogance, no shiny lights, skinny jeans, or crafty words, no haze machine, donuts or coffee in the lobby, just a naked, dying man on a cross, unable to even fold his hands to pray. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. John three sixteen. period. Wow. That just kind of cuts through everything, doesn't it? Got a little emotional yeah, there. Yeah, that's easy to, to do with, with something like this. Yes. And so, folks, as we enter Holy Week, um, I, I, I hope that we would just keep our eyes fixed on what's really important. Amen, yes. The, the grace of God, you know, not cr modern day Christianity, <laughs> modern day Christendom, which has done a masterful job at forgetting this simple concept. Mm. You know, yes. pe people today are throwing a w around this word gospel all the time. Very few people, I think, understand what it really means. Yeah. That we are saved completely on the basis of grace, fulfilling a condition, the only condition that God requires, which is faith, trust, or confidence in the God-man, Jesus Christ. Yes. And that alone is what saves it doesn't yeah. matter if you're Republican or Democrat, <laughs> rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're a dispensationalist or a covenant theologian or a reformed theologian. It doesn't matter what so-called race you belong to or what your skin color is. It doesn't, doesn't matter if the house you live in is yours or it's stolen. Uh, it, no, nothing matters when it comes to eternity. The only thing that matters is the grace of God and, and you receiving that as a gift by way of faith. Yes. So as we gather in our different places of worship, you know, over Holy Week, let's just keep that on the forefront of our thinking. Amen. Uh, let's remember what the whole thing is about. And um, I would just invite anybody within the sound of my voice that has never received this grace or trusted in the Savior, you know, they can do that right now. Yes. It's, as the article indicates, the thief on the cross didn't get baptized. <laughs> he didn't pray the sinner's prayer. Yeah. He didn't go to church. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anybody out there that, that wants to be right with the God that made them, we would just uh, exhort them yes. to place their personal faith in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. Amen. And so I think that's a great way to, to end this particular program yes. as we transition into Holy Week. We do like to, in the midst of some of the bad news that we brought to folks today, incorporate some good news like the one true gospel of grace. Yes. But the one true gospel of grace, once you receive it, it dials you into certain promises. I like that. Not the least of which is Titus 2.13. What does yes, that sir. say? Titus 2.13. We're looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. So as this world falls apart and moves into the new world order and Armageddon, we have this promise that before God's wrath hits planet Earth, Jesus has promised to come and retrieve his own yes. from, the, from the world before the wrath of God hits. And that is the promise of the rapture, Amen. which is um, 
a wonderful promise among countless others that you receive when you trust in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just a couple of infomercials before we wrap, uh, wrap up today. Keep in mind uh, to get our app. Just go to the App Store, uh, type in Andy Woods Ministries into the search engine, and you can get our free app where we upload our content Amen. regularly. Yes. Beyond that, Pastor's Point of View is available in podcast format. Go to wherever it is you get your podcasts and put Andy Woods Ministries into the search engine and Pastor's Point of View will be available to you in podcast format. Um, I remind also that the show notes and the links that we read from are available to you for the asking. Just go to andywoodsministries.org, which is our website, where we also upload our content. And then there's a conspicuous way to sign up for the show notes on the homepage. To go ahead and sign up for those. And once you make a decision to do that, these show notes that we read from will show up in your inbox. Yes. Um, every time we post a new pastor's point of view show, I want to make you aware of Chafer Theological Seminary. I am president of a school that will equip you to rightfully divide God's words should you sense a calling into ministry. So go to chafer.edu to learn about that. And I'm very happy to announce the return of our journal, um, which we haven't had for many years. But now, thanks to the hard work of a lot of really good people, the journal has made a comeback. That's our academic journal. I believe it's going to be published twice a year at Chafer. We renamed it Pneumatikos, which means spiritually, after Lewis Berry Chafer's famous book, He That Is Spiritual. Yeah. And this is where you can find academic articles. A lot of great articles are in there in the first edition. I have an article uh, there on why the rapture is not taught in Matthew 24, verses 40 and 41. One taken, the other left. People very article. sadly try to turn that into a rapture passage, yeah. and it just brings total confusion. I have an article there explaining why that is not a rapture passage. Yeah. If you want to find the rapture in the teachings of Jesus, you don't look there. You look into the upper room in John 14, verses 1 through 3, which I'll be explaining yeah. in part two of the article. But as you can see from the screen, there's a, a QR code. Is that what they're called? Q, yeah. QR, QRL code, whatever it's called, um, where you can access the journal in hard copy, free PDF, and it's also available on Amazon. So it's, it's easy to get hold of. So if you're interested in academic Great. articles defending dispensational truth, I recommend to you our Chafer Theological Seminary Journal called Pneumatikos. I also want to remind people of the Sugarland Bible Church Prophecy Conference that we just had at the end of February. You can go to our website, www.slbc.org, and you go over to, I think it's sermons uh -huh. or media, yeah. one, of, one of the two, and sermons, yeah. and just click on the Flood to Final Days conference. And all of the sessions, you know, done by myself, David Reagan, Russ Miller, Olivier Melnick, the Q&A sessions will all be available to you, you know, at yeah. your fingertips. They're there. So those are available on the Sugarland Bible Church website. I want to remind you of the fact that I'll be speaking at a VCY America radio rally uh, in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, April 27th, 2024. I believe that's a Saturday. And you can go to uh, VCY to learn about that. Um, love to meet all of our folks out there uh, in the Wisconsin, Milwaukee area. So I wanted to make you aware of that. Also, I'm speaking at the Mid-America Prophecy Conference in Tulsa, Oklahoma, May the 24th and 25th, 2024, featuring notables such as Dr. Joe Martin, Dr. J.B. Hickson, Philip Goodman, and then the keynote speaker is uh, uh, Bridgette Gabriel, who has a great testimony coming out of Islam 
Oh, boy. Um, warning us. I think she was uh, born in Lebanon, so she knows all about Islam. Yeah. And exposing sort of the American ignorance of the Islamic takeover agenda yeah. uh, that uh, we, America, is now being subjected to. I want to wish everyone a very, very happy next week, Holy Week, um, as we commemorate, as we said earlier, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep the grace of God foremost on your minds. And because it's Holy Week and because of scheduling issues, we're not going to be having a pastor's point of view on that particular Friday called Good Friday. But we'll pick up pastor's point of view the following Friday, uh, subsequent to uh, Resurrection Sunday. So um, sometimes when pastor's point of view is not available every Friday, people <laughs> phone in and write, what happened? And did you guys get thrown in prison or, or what? Um, don't panic. We'll be back the following week. We just you mean they don't say he was at the rapture? <laughs> yeah. Or they say it's the did rapture. Did you get thrown in prison? Did I, did I miss the rapture? That's another one. <laughs> so we'll be back the following week. Uh, thank you for watching, praying for, supporting, sharing pastor's point of view. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. God bless.